Whenever this is reported in the media, it is referred to as a, a three-parent baby or a three-parent family. To me, this is an entirely misleading concept. When you think about what parenthood means, it means far more, usually, than just genes. But then, even if you restrict it to that, something like 25,000 genes come from the nuclear genetic material, and about 37 genes come from the donor of the, the mitochondria. So you're talking about a, a genetic inheritance, a contribution from the donor of 0.1 of 1%. I mean, it is a vanishingly small amount of material. To suggest that they are a parent really makes nonsense of the complete concept of, of parenthood, I think. A small number of genes can have, have a huge effect, which is indeed why they're thinking of doing it, because these genes can have a devastating effect if they're faulty. The fact that your mitochondrial genes come only from your mother mean they're quite useful in population genetics. And they have been used in a lot of scientific studies to, to find out where a group of people have come from and what part of the world they've come from and how they've moved or mixed with other people. And for that reason, because identity and history could be important to people, the mitochondria could be important to people. For a child, whether they're going to die in infancy uh, or in their teenage years, this is a a much bigger issue than whether there was a third person donating some cellular material. There's no absolute measurement of safety. There's a lot more research that still needs to be done and as far as possible the researchers will want to show that there appears to be no unexpected damage done to an embryo that has had its mitochondria replaced with healthy mitochondria. But you can never prove that something is completely safe until it's been tried in human beings and there will come a point where that leap of faith has to be made, just as it was when the first baby was conceived by IVF or when the first person had a heart transplant or a kidney transplant. One of the areas that we're doing the most research in at the moment is trying to work out the safety and indeed the efficiency of these techniques. If we have that and we have the animal data, then I, I think we can then start to look with an expert committee as to whether or not this is safe. So it would be available only in specific centres. Most centres would have to be able to provide both the IVF techniques, but also the ability to analyse the embryos appropriately. We're very fortunate we have a very stringent regulation of IVF services. And this would be regulated in exactly the same as way as other IVF techniques are. If scientific advance is going to go forward, the UK is a very good place for it because we have such excellent regulation. And I would be very upset if it, this was stopped in the UK and my patients who, who thought they wanted to have it were whisked off to somewhere like China or Russia where there's no regulation and probably the genetic counselling would be very inferior to what it would be here. The converse will happen though, that if we make these treatments available here and they're not easily available elsewhere, some people might come here from other countries in order to be treated, and that could make it more difficult to follow up their children when they return home again afterwards. People may be concerned that if we don't develop this, then somebody else might develop it. But there are many things that we don't do in Europe which are done outside Europe, uh, and we don't do them because we don't think it's a sensible thing to do. I think ultimately the question is, do we think this is the kind of thing that we want to promote um, and therefore promote in a safe way? Or do we think this is the kind of step that we don't want to take for larger social reasons? Up till now, um people have had pre-implantation genetic diagnosis which does involve selecting embryos that are unaffected by a genetic condition but we've never before had the possibility of treatment that actually modifies the DNA with a modification that not only affects the individual conceived after treatment but also any descendants of that individual as well and that does cross a very important line which is why the Nuffield Council on Bioethics felt that these treatments should be classified as germline alterations. We're really asking do we want to start treating diseases by intervening? Do we want to start treating diseases by uh, modifying the embryo? And if we do, then 
we should say yes now. But if we're worried about that kind of thing, then we should say no now, because this is the time we make that decision. So if this technique is introduced, there should be a concerted effort to follow up not only the children that are born of this technique, to find out if they really are as healthy as we hope they would be, but also the children's children and the children's children's children. In other words, to follow this down the generations. All follow-up studies are difficult to do. Following up over decades is even harder. For an unborn child, when they get to the age of 16, they're in charge of their own destiny and nobody can make that child um, agree to carry on with this kind of follow-up and they can be strongly advised it's in the best interest but nobody can force that child to do it in the same way I don't think anybody can force that child to reveal to any future genetic partners uh, about their original origins it's, it's their human right to, uh, to not to do so. I think the thing that worries me most about this treatment is once you've crossed that ethical line of altering the human germline, uh, then people will start to say, OK, well, now you've allowed this, uh, there's no reason why you should stop us from, for example, modifying uh, nuclear genes that also lead to mitochondrial disorders. And then the next step after that will be what people normally refer to as, as designer babies. The slippery slope argument says you, because you've done one, you're, you know, inevitably you're bound to do the other. And I've no doubt that some people say, OK, you've altered uh, the genes in the mitochondria. So surely then the next logical thing to do is start working on the nucleus. It may be a logical thing to do, it may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing. But certainly it should never be done without a big, big consultation first. The reason it's not a slippery slope is that to actually get this made lawful, this limited step, there has to be a vote in Parliament. So if it was ever going to change beyond that, you'd need to pass a new law. That's not slippery, it's extremely difficult. I think we always tend to be told, oh, we've got, we can have tight regulation, but regulation shifts, that's the slippery slope. Uh, a few years down the line they say, OK, well you've allowed this, so that now there's no logical case why you shouldn't allow the next step. A slippery slope? I don't think so. There is an absolute clear dividing line between these two approaches to our, our inheritance. This technique is specifically for patients who carry the risks of serious mitochondrial DNA disease. It will really be for these conditions and patients who have the risk of transmitting this to their children. No one who has mitochondrial disease will be cured by this. So it's not about treating people who are ill. It's about shaping future generations in a particular way. If their parents didn't make that choice, would people say their parents shouldn't have had them? Or um, should they have the same kind of, of, of benefits? Are they as welcome in society? So what starts as a choice for an individual um, ends up impacting on other people who haven't made the same choice. I don't accept the argument that peer pressure means there'll be pressure on parents to have a procedure that they don't want to have. People are already choosing indirectly the attributes of their children, so it isn't a new thing to say, how about giving them the option of saying, we're going to have a healthy child rather than the child with a debilitating or terminal illness that may even kill them in childhood or adolescence. Once you start modifying your child's genes, there's a sense in which you're shaping them to your desires and your whims. And a, a fundamental thing about being human is that your sort of genetic essence has not been manipulated by other people to suit their desires. Uh, you know, you're not an object to be manipulated, you're a person. Many families go through agonising decisions about having children and um, we all make reproductive choices. I think one of the things that's very important is that people see that this is to try and provide reproductive choice to women that carry these mutations. So the overall gains for these families is the potential of having a child that is free of mitochondrial disease. And for them, the gains are very significant. If we don't treat these diseases in the UK, firstly, patients will continue to consider having children and may well have seriously affected children. 
The other thing is, if we don't offer this in the UK, there's no reason why this wouldn't be offered in other countries where this would not be carefully regulated. There's a really good alternative of egg donation that's available to patients with maternally transmitted mitochondrial DNA disease. And you know, that completely eliminates the risk of mitochondrial DNA transmission. And as well as that, the mother has the advantage that she's carried the child in her uterus. So I think it's a, it's a very, very significant um, and useful alternative. There's a very, very small number of patients who've got severe mitochondrial DNA disease where the second alternative, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, we call that PGD, just isn't applicable. It could be you know, half a dozen families in the UK. The difficulty is that because we've only just started doing PGD, it's going to take most patients several years before they know that it's not applicable to them.